Yes? Hey guys, and my name is Frank Dorov, and welcome to a new episode of Digital Classroom. Now, what is Digital Classroom? Well, I love to inspire people and teach stuff to you guys. Now, we've done a lot of instructional videos, and those are awesome. You can rewind them, you can pause them, and you can do whatever you want. There's also a lot of stuff, of course, online, like on Kelby Training, uh, Kelby One, and of course, on our YouTube channel. Now, the YouTube channel is gonna change a lot during 2016. We have a lot of new ideas, we're gonna do a lot of stuff, and below you can now see where you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. I hope, Daisy, did it work out? Awesome. So having my feedback with my assistants, of course. Behind the computer today, we have Daisy, and behind the cameras, we have Anna Week and Lisa Lot. And we have our son in the studio and a new intern who's going to take over from Daisy as soon as her internship stops. Now, Digital Classroom is something in between a workshop and a video. Now, a video you can pause, rewind, but you can never ask any questions. A workshop is a real one-on-one -on -one experience. It's like being there, talking to me, and I will answer all your questions. Now, Digital Classroom is something in between. You guys can ask any question you want in the chat room, and Daisy will actually say when people have a question, and I will try to answer that question during the live shoot. But most of all, Digital Classroom is fun. It's me working in the studio and showing you guys what we do. Now, normally we have broad light in the studio, right? And in this case, it's pretty dark. And that's because it's January. No, I'm just kidding with you guys. It's because we're doing something really special today. We're not going to use any strobes. No, sorry, no strobes at all. What we're going to do is we're going to use the cheapest light source of, well, it's not the cheapest light source, but it's a very cheap light source. We're going to use tungsten light. So normal light bulbs, and maybe we even throw in something with the ice lights from Westcott. So this is a non-strobe, non-technique digital classroom. Well, non-technique? That's not completely true, because working with these kind of light sources can be pretty tricky. But it can be a lot of fun, and you can do it at home, because everybody has tungsten light, right? Or a LED light, it doesn't matter. Now, Digital Classroom is a dream of me. I always wanted to do this, this real interactive, straight from our studio, but it costs a lot of money and effort to, uh, f to be able to do this. And this is why we're very happy with BenQ and Rogue Expo Imaging for supporting us. So during Digital Classroom, you will actually see some commercials from those guys, and trust me, they're awesome. Now, one of the things that you have to do is answer questions during Digital Classroom, and that's why Daisy now has a question. The average live view? Yeah, it's only 40 seconds. I don't know what I mean. I don't hear you. Okay, average live view is 40 seconds. We don't know what it means, but as far as we can see on our side, everything works. Again, we are recording on our laptop, so if something goes wrong, we still have the recording, so don't worry. But it's always a problem when you do some stuff with uh, YouTube Live, so there can be some delays or problems. Just refresh, and it will probably work out fine. Okay, so the most important thing in a photo shoot is, of course, the model. So, who do we have today? Today we have something really special for you guys. We have one of our, well, best models, very good friend, very all-round cool girl, and of course, one of the most crazy stylists in the world, well, at least in the Netherlands, uh, at least in our studio. Well, no further ado, Miss Nadine. So, Nadine, how are you? Okay. Hello. So, as you can see, Nadine is uh, getting on the set. And the, for the first setup, we're going to do something really simple. We're just going to use a light bulb. And as you can see, it's a really harsh quality of light. So how do you create something from such a harsh quality of light? Well, very, very simple. You just shoot it, right? Well, let's see what happens if we just shoot it. So I'm going to grab my camera, and we're going to take a first shot. go. Now I'm shooting into Capture One, of course, because that's one of the most solid solutions for tethering. Okay, the camera is connected, and now first I'm going to do manual, auto ISO, and I'm going to shoot on 3.5, a 40th of a second, and just see what happens. So I'm going to zoom in on my model. Really nice meeting. Awesome. Focus on our closest eye. There we go. And just take the shot and see what comes in. Now, as you can see, the shot comes in and it's it's okay, but it's not perfect. Now, what ISO did I use? I don't know. 
I just shut it. It's on manual, it's auto ISO. I set my shutter speed, I set my aperture, and the camera will find out what's the best exposure. Will that always work? No. Now, why didn't I use a light meter? Because I'm that big guy always promoting light meters, right? Well, if you do stuff like this, it can often happen that you move a little bit further away or a little bit closer. And it will change the exposure. And sometimes that can be pretty cool. Now, I hear you guys going like, Frank, you're shooting manual. How can the camera determine your exposure? Very simple. You always have to see the exposure in different settings. So you have the shutter speed, you have the aperture, and you have the ISO. Now, the ISO is on auto, meaning I can set my shutter speed on a 40th. I can set my aperture on the desired depth of field, for example, 4, or in this case, 3.5 or 2.8. And the camera with the ISO will actually determine my exposure. So let's take one more shot. That's very simple. There we go. And it still works pretty well. <coughs> Now, what if I want to underexpose just a little bit? That's no problem at all. What I can actually do is I can still use my exposure correction. So, exposure settings. So, let's go to minus two. There we go. And now I actually took two stops off, making the picture a lot darker. So, this way you can really play with it. It's just your exposure compensation. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, so let's get it back to zero. Now you're going like, can you do this with a light meter? Of course you can. The problem with the light meter is, if my model moves a little bit more forward, or a little bit more to the back, she will actually change in exposure. Now with strobes, that's not a problem, because strobes are often a little bit further away than we have the light bulb over here. The main thing with the light bulb is, if you want real interesting light quality, you have to place that light bulb really close to your model. Because now the light will fall off really fast. You have a lot of light on your model, so you don't need those insane high ISOs. And you get a way more contrasty image. Now, I do want to include the light source, right? Because I don't just want to shoot it. I want to see what my light source is. Now, in this case, you already see the light bulb on top. So, Daisy, at the moment, they see our Capture One image? Yes. Okay, cool. So, let's take another one. And let's start with portrait mode in this case. And there we go. Now you can see that as soon as I start zooming out, my camera is totally confused. And it's actually lost the connection, so let's connect again. One moment. Okay, let's turn it off. And let's connect. Okay guys, this can happen of course during a live broadcast. Sometimes things go wrong. So we don't panic here. Ah. We just reconnect. That was actually my mistake. And make the connection again to Capture One. Okay, can you guys check the cables very quickly? Oh, and you have a question. Okay, let's do the question first. What happens if you won't use auto ISO? Okay, what will happen if I don't use auto ISO? The main reason for auto ISO is that the camera will determine everything by itself. If you don't use auto ISO, you have to set everything manually. This is when you start using a light meter. This is when you want that perfect exposure. And that's when you also don't have the problem that I wanted to show you now, is when I zoom out, the camera actually messes up. If I zoom in, there's no problem at all, but as soon as I start zooming out, the camera will try to calculate everything to 18% gray. There's a lot of darks in there, so it will actually overexpose the image. Yes, another question. How do you know what ISO you should use? Okay, we have connection, uh, Lisa Lot, so it works. We had one loose cable, sorry guys. What was the question? Uh, how do you know what ISO you should use? Okay, how do you know what ISO you should use? There is no, and this is the same thing with all the people asking me, what lens should I buy for graffiti shots? What lens should I buy for landscapes? Or what is the perfect portrait lens? There is no perfect ISO. You have to know your camera. So if you know your camera is great up until ISO 1600, then you don't go up ISO 1600, so you start using a tripod. If you know, like in this case, the camera can handle 8000 without any problem, then you can go up to 8000. So let's see what happens when we do a portrait setting. Okay, there we go. Now, as soon as the image comes in, you can actually see that it's now overexposed, and not by a small part. 
Now, of course, I can now start doing that minus 2, or even minus 3 maybe. Do the same thing again. Very nice. And now it's like, it's almost there, but now it's a little bit too dark. So you open up again. Now, how does this look for your client? You're a professional photographer, right? And you start doing stuff like this. That's not right, right? It's a little bit unprofessional. So let's bring out my good old friend, the light meter. Okay, so let me see where the light meter is. Here we go. Okay, the first thing you do with the light meter, of course, is power it up. Now, there's a sun mode, and what I will actually do is I will meter on the sun mode on aperture mode. I know I'm shooting approximately f4, so I'm going to raise the, um, the aperture a little bit to f4, and the only thing that my light meter now will tell me is the shutter speed, but I have to set an ISO. Now let's go, because I know that I can do it with this, let's go to ISO 800. So I'm going to go to ISO 800 and I'm metering the light on our model Nadine. So very close. Okay, on ISO 800 I get a reading of 4.02. This means f4 and 2 tenths of an f-stop. Now if I go to f4, 125th on ISO 800, I have a proper exposure but it's 2 tenths of an f-stop overexposed. So what I will actually do is I will slightly underexpose it by setting my camera on 4.5. So that's one click higher than f4. I also now know my ISO, so I don't have to think about it anymore. So let's go to ISO. Let's go to 800. There we go. Let's go to 125th, f4.5. And let's um, raise up. There we go. Okay, take the same shot first, a portrait, so I'm really zoomed in. That's nice. Now if you see the image coming in, we actually have a great exposed image. Nothing is blown out, it looks great. And now when I do the portrait setting, which first was overexposing like crazy, there we go. Now I don't have that problem anymore. It doesn't try to figure out what it is. It's very constant and very, very stable. Now to give a little bit mood to this image, what I'm actually going to do is my light meter is just the start. Because I'm using a light bulb, I want to give it a little bit of extra. So what I'm going to do is actually overexpose, not by accident, but by choice. So let's go down to, let's say, 3.5 and lower the shutter speed just a little bit to 100th of a second. There we go. I really like this effect. Nice knitting. Really cool. Now, one of the things when you're shooting with a light bulb is that the problem you can have is that on the side you can actually have a reflection, as you can see in the image you see now on screen. Now, that reflection can be cool, but it can also not be cool. Now, always remember that what you see through the lens is actually the image you're going to shoot, right? So, if you see the reflection, you just move your camera a little bit and take the reflection out. Now, if you don't have that room, you can actually move a little bit back and zoom in more, because if you zoom in more, you make the angle of view a little bit smaller. So let's zoom in a little bit, move back and cut out that reflection. There we go. Now that looks a lot better. Now I've did the same thing, but now the reflection is gone. Okay, now I want to get that picture a little bit more in sync with what Nadine is wearing. So I have to coach my model, but I also have to choose a slightly different position to shoot from. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to shoot up. Now this means that the light bulb will also change position. So when you set something like this up, make sure beforehand you test it out, which we didn't. So this is going to be fun. Okay, so I'm going to sit down and give Lisa a lot my light meter. There you go. And uh, let me see what happens. Nice knitting, very cool. That's cool. Okay, a little bit more in the posing. There we go. Chin up just a little bit and look towards the light. Awesome. Now you can see the blinkies in her eyes. The catch lights. Very important to give an image more depth. Awesome. That's nice. Okay, do a few more in landscape mode. And make sure we cut out that reflection, so I don't like that. Oop, don't fall down. Very nice knitting. Cool. And a few without the light bulb in the picture. Just a little bit of the lens flare from the light bulb. There we go. 
gives it a little bit more atmosphere because you don't know exactly what kind of light source is being used. It gives you a really cool look. So I really like this. Now let's say that I want a little bit more shadow detail. I just want a little bit more. Now we have those LED panels here, right, from LEDGO. And they're normally used to light me. Who says you can't use them to light your model, right? So we're going to set up the lights just a little bit higher. And the nice thing about constant lighting is I can see exactly what I'm doing. So let's make it a little bit more reddish light. There we go. And I'm just mixing those two together now. There are no rules in this. You have to do what you like best. There we go. Now we have a little bit more detail in all the blacks. That's really cool. Chin up just a little bit. That's nice. Awesome. Okay, one with both reflections in again. So there we go. Just because it's cool. Really nice. Okay. And one that's really close up and aim down. Always make sure that the eyes are in focus. Chin up just a little bit, maybe. Really nice. And the final shot. And the really final, final shot. And the final shot. Chin up just a little bit. There we go. We always have a lot of final shots. Now, why do we have a lot of final shots? For the very simple reason. If you say, this is the final shot, the model will try a little bit harder. Well, we do one more final shot and the model will try a little bit harder. And that way you really get a cool shot. So we did some shots. Let's see what we can do in Photoshop with these images. And Nadine is going to set up for the next shot. So I'm going to walk to my computer and we're going to start up Photoshop. So we're going to switch. And we have three questions which I'm going to try to answer while we're switching. So let me see. Um, okay, one of the questions from Ben is, do you meter towards the camera or towards the light source? We always meter towards the area that we want correctly lit. In other words, you don't meter towards your camera and you don't meter towards the light source. And I will tell you very quickly why, but first I will switch to my uh, monitor, otherwise you can see everybody running around in the studio. There we go. Now, it's an incident light meter, meaning it meters the light falling on the light meter. So let's say if you want your light to be correct on the face of the model, you always hold the light meter in front of that area that you want correctly lit. So if the light hits that area, it will be correct. Now in most cases in the studio, that means we actually point towards the light source. Okay, let me see. Johan asks, if you would use smoke in this case, would that be of influence in the quality of light? Everything you put in front of the light will influence the quality of light. So if you use smoke, smoke will actually act as a diffuser or as a reflector. So yes, it will definitely have influence of the quality of light. Okay, did you set white balance before the shoot? Normally we use a color checker. In this case we didn't because I want to do something freaky with the colors later on. But if you want correct color, you always shoot with a color checker or, of course, you do it with a gray, a gray card. Okay, uh, let me see. Another question. The light bulb in landscape mode gives a reflection on the background. Can you avoid this or do you edit them out later? As I said in the video, you can actually zoom in and cut it out or just change the composition. Let me see. I did the final shot technique and it works incredibly well. I know, Emil, it's awesome, right? It works really, really well. Okay, so... Um, we get a lot of questions about the light meter. So what I will want to show you guys is we actually did a video on the light meter, which you can order on our website. And I'm going to show you the trailer for that. So I can uh, set up everything for editing. And in between, I'm going to show you the trailer for our light meter video. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorov and I'm the author of the book Mastering the Model Shoot. Now, you guys really like the book because we're getting a lot of rave reviews on Amazon and every other online store. So, that actually triggered us to make a video series about the book. Now, in the first video, I will tell you everything about the light meter. 
Now in digital photography, I think the light meter is the one thing that confuses people a lot. Uh, shouldn't I use the histogram, Frank? Isn't there a meter inside the camera? Where do I point the meter? Towards the pretty girl? Towards the camera? Towards the light source? Where? There's a lot of confusion out there. Now in this video, I will give you in more than 70 minutes all the insights out about the light meter. Calibrating, using incident and reflective, uh, using a white background, how to keep details in the black, how to trigger the meter, uh, where to point the meter. You will see everything very easily explained, but you will also see photo shoots including our model Manon. This is one of the videos if you're slightly interested in the light meter or if you already have a light meter and you want to know everything about it, get this video. It's called Mastering the Model Shoot, the Light Meter and it's the first video in a whole series that we're going to release in connection to our book Mastering the Model Shoot and it's available now from our website. Okay guys, so we're behind Capture One at the moment and uh, people ask me this a lot. Is Capture One the same as Lightroom? Yes and no. Uh, a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you, you can do just as easily in Lightroom. It's just that we prefer Capture One because of the stability during the tethering. But there's absolutely no difference in what you can do. I also believe, by the way, that the raw quality of Capture One is a little bit better than Lightroom. And one of the things that I really like, if you want to check your focus, you have to loop and watch the speed. This is really fast and when you use Lightroom you always have to wait a little bit and that's sometimes a little bit tedious so that's actually why I prefer Capture One. So you can set the loop size, uh, in my case, to large and you can also determine how much zoom you want, in this case 100% and as you can see it renders really fast. Okay, let's go through the images and I am really strict about the images. Now, if I don't like an image, it's gone immediately. Now, here I don't see the catch light, so that image is gone. I don't like this image posing wise, so it's gone. No catch lights. Overexposed. Underexposed. And this is why we start using the light meter. This all doesn't look right. Now, as soon as you start using the light meter, this is where everything starts to fall together. So, really like the shot, don't like the reflection, take it out. Don't see any cat slides, don't see any cat slides. There we go, R like this pose, I don't see any cat slides, but I still like the pose, so maybe we can fix that. Here we have the cat slides, so we can delete that shot. So, I really like this one, so give it five stars. Okay, there we go, that's okay, don't like that one. That one is okay, this one is awesome, this one is really nice. I don't like the hand in the previous one. This one is really cool as a portrait. Nice with the lens flare, but I think there are better ones. Love this one posing wise. This is awesome. This is one of my favorites up until now. It's okay, but the hand was a little bit too big. Here we started adding the LED lights as you can see, so we have a little bit more detail in the blacks. And this is okay. Like this one a little bit better. This one is cool, so we can delete that one. Here we have the reflection in, and I did this on purpose just to see if I like it. Uh, don't like the hand. This one is cool, give it five stars. Nice portrait, five stars. A little bit too tired in her eyes. A little bit too close. I like that one too, and I like that one too, but not good enough. So let's go to the five stars. So if I go back, you see that I've selected a lot of images. I've selected this one and now when I know the other ones, I actually like this one a little bit less, so zero. This one is okay. I like that one more, so also give this one zero. So I like this one. I like that one less. I love this one and I love that one. 
and I like that one. So I think these three are actually the best, so take that one out. I'm not going to retouch all three of them, of course. I'm just going to retouch one or two to show you guys what we do in workflow. Now, let's say that you like it like this, but you want a little bit more shadow and you forgot to put on the LED light, right? Now, what I can do is I can actually go here into adjustments and just add a little bit of shadow detail. But I don't want it on the whole image, of course. What I want it on is just one part. Let's say only in the feathers. So you can go here and in Lightroom you can do this with your adjustment brush. And here I have to create a new layer. Take my brush and I will actually paint in. And it's lagging now like crazy because we are doing screen captures and sending over my desktop. So it's a little bit slow. Just bear with me guys. It's not Capture One's problem, it's purely because we're doing this live. Okay. Now let's say we just want to open that up a little bit. So go to Exposure and go to Shadows. That's way too much of course. Lower the exposure again a little bit. Okay, just enough. So before and after. Cool. So now we want to open this up in Photoshop to do our final retouching, of course. So we go into the gears and make sure that you have a recipe, Frank to Photoshop, which actually creates a TIFF 16 bits, uncompressed Pro Photo RGB with a fixed scale 100% and opens up Photoshop. The only thing I now have to do is Command D on the Mac and it will open up my Photoshop. Let me see if there are any questions in between. Uh, let me see. Is there a big difference between older models like L358 and a new digital L478? Yes, there is Derek. Uh, I actually prefer the 758 because it has a one degree spot. But if you're new to light meters, check out the 478 because it's an old digital light meter and it makes it a little bit easier for people to get adjusted to the whole light metering stuff. Uh, the reason I prefer the L758 is because it has a one degree spot and this is something that I do use a lot on locations and of course also to make sure that there's detail in a dress or in something white. Uh, let me see, Johan asks, how big are the files you're shooting into Capture One? You're still using the Sony DSLR now, right? Yes, I'm using the A7R2, meaning I'm shooting with 42 megapixels, which is pretty cool, but Sony now has just released 100 megapixels in their Phase One, and I will be shooting with that one in New York. So that's going to be awesome. Okay, so let me see. The first thing I always do is I go to 100% on the face, and I will try to clean up as much as I can without using any filtering. Now, I use this little device over here. It's called the Spot Healing Brush. Now, of course, this is way too big, so we're going to change the brush size. There we go. And one of the things that a lot of people ask me, why is it oval with you? Well, if you go here into your settings, you can actually make it round. This is how it officially starts in Photoshop. What I always do is make it an oval because then it's not so obvious that you retouched and you can touch areas where you normally can't. So I will take out some of the harsher areas in our skin. There we go. And I, I don't like Barbies, so I normally don't overdo my skin stuff. I will always try to keep it as natural as possible. There we go. Now when I do a beauty portrait, I will do a technique called frequency separation which is pretty cool and we automated it so we can do that very quickly. But I also want to show you guys, oops, that went wrong. I also want to show you guys that you can do it with just one click of a filter. Now one of the best kept secrets I think is the filter image nomic portraiture and it's not really a secret because, well, everybody knows that it exists, right? Only a lot of pros won't tell you that they use it a lot. I don't care, I just want you guys to be uh, let me put it this way, inspired by my photography and not by the magic that we do in Photoshop. So I will always tell you what kind of filters I use. And in our case, it's image nomic portraiture. I don't know what's going on here. This is really weird, never saw that happen before. Okay, so if your spot healing brush doesn't work like here, I don't know what's going on, it does something really weird. You can always revert back to your normal healing brush, make the size a little bit smaller, and now you have to sample somewhere. So I will sample here. I'll just take these little nasty things out, so this works a lot better. Only now you have to sample every time you want to do something. This is actually before the last update of Photoshop, I always worked with sample and 
heal, sample, heal, sample, heal. It's like a mantra, sample, heal, sample, heal. Don't be hypnotized, it's sample, heal. There we go. So, but I, I do actually like from the new Photoshop, I like the new patch, uh, sorry, the new spot healing brush. It's really, really nice. Okay, so now it looks already okay. The only thing I now do is I want to flatten out all the colors in her skin. And that's when I'm going to use the filter. I'm going to go into filter, I'm going to go into image nomic portraiture. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. No, no questions at the moment. So, go into 100%. And just see the before and after. And this is without doing anything. This is just its automatic magic. Now, if you want to sample, you can actually press here the plus and just sample some skin areas where you want the filter to be active. There we go. As you can see, it's very, very subtle. Well, it's not really subtle, but it works. And press OK. OK. Now it has created a new layer. And the fun thing about layers is that the layer underneath is the original. And this is the copy, right? But you can make them blend together. So let's do that. Layer, layer mask, hide all. Now what I do is I take out the effect completely, as you can see here. Now I have a black piece of paper over here, the black canvas. Now if black hides, white shows, right? So I'm going to take a brush, and I'm going to take the brush with pure white paint, and I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. There we go. And we're just going to paint the effect in, in all the areas where I want it. Now, if you read the brochure from Image Nomic Portraiture, it will actually tell you that you don't have to do this because it, because it only targets the areas of the skin. Uh, that's very nice that they tell you that in a brochure, but it's not the reality. Well, actually, it is the reality. The only problem is there are also, in other scenes, there are always skin tones. For example, in a wall or in clothing, there are areas that have the same tint or uh, luminosity of your skin, and those will also be affected. So what I always do, I will always use a layer mask to take the effect out, and later on paint it back in again. There we go. So this looks really nice. A fit on screen. Okay, so we're almost done. Now the only thing that I always do in my images, I will run a little bit of magic. And that little bit of magic actually comes from Intensify, from MacFun. Now MacFun is a really cool partner of us. And they actually did something really special for you guys. Now, if you go to this part of our website, www.frankdorof.com slash MacFun, you can actually get a really cool deal for their whole Creative Suite 2016. And that's only 99 bucks at the moment. 99 bucks for the whole Creative Suite. And normally it's, I believe, over 400. So grab it right after Digital Classroom because you don't want to miss anything, of course. It will be online for the full day. And also after that, but the price can change. So they made a really special deal for you guys today for 99 bucks for the whole suite. It only works on Mac, so that's why it's called Mac Fun. And let me see. So let's go into Mac Fun Intensify. So we go into Filter, Mac Fun Intensify. And this is all in the Creative Suite. So everything you're going to see me using today, except of course Image Nomic Portraiture, is in the Creative Suite because we're also going to do some black and white conversions in a moment. Okay, so we have all these presets over here, and what uh, y these presets you can make yourself, and I actually like this one always, Poppy Drama 3. As you can see, it really enhances the background. It gives it a lot more bite. So let's press Apply, and it's now processing. Let me check if there are any questions in between. Uh, Arnold asks me, I always work with Lightroom, is it wise to do Photoshop and fine tune it further? Yes, it is. Uh, Lightroom is cool and it has an adjustment brush and everything and it works pretty good. But in Photoshop you can really fine tune your images and do a lot more, more precise work. And so yes, I always prefer uh, Photoshop. Okay, so the effect is in now and I like it on the whole picture except on the face. I don't like it on the face too much. So we're going to do the same trick again, layer, layer mask, and we're going to do, in this case, a reveal all. Now you will see a white piece of paper showing everything. Now we take a brush, and we're going to do the brush with black paint. Now what I'm going to do, is I'm going to take the effect out of the areas where I don't want it. There we go. It goes really nice. Okay. 
looks pretty nice now compared to the previous before after now if you want to give a little bit more brightness to this area just go to the bottom layer the background you go to image adjustments curves and just bump it up there we go just a little bit don't overdo this okay nice okay i always do a layer flatten image but that's my way of working Okay, now let's start tinting the image, because this is okay, this is cool, but now I always want to give it my special sauce, my special look. Now I love analog photography, and this is why I always want to tint my images, it's like an addiction, I really want to have that certain look. Now one of the filters I love to use for this is DxO Film Pack, but also Alien Skin, and in this case I want to go a little bit more overboard, so I'm going to use Alien Skin Exposure X, meaning 10, they skipped 8 and 9. So a lot of uh, software manufacturers are doing that today. Now this is again, the first I do the clickety click until I see what I like idea. So I'm just going to go over my presets. I'm just going to see which one I like. And the black and whites I actually like better in uh, Mac Fun, in tonality. But actually as you can see here, there are some pretty cool black and whites. So let's take one that I like. I already saw one. I love this one. And this one is also pretty cool. Let, let's go for this one. And as you can see, my preference is always a little bit toned down. I, I don't like that whole over-the-top Instagram kind of look. I always like it to be a little bit more normal. So before and after. It just makes it a little bit dark and gives it a little bit of a tint. Okay, so let's go here and just bump the shadows just a little bit up. Oops. Very, very sensitive. There you go, I really love this. Just very, very subtle. Okay, press apply. And it's all in the details, you know guys, it's it's not, don't overdo this, don't Instagram the heck out of your images. This is more than enough. Just gives you a little bit more contrast here and a little bit more darkness over the whole area. Now let's say you want those feathers to show up a little bit more. So first again, flatten your image, create a duplicate layer. And this is the way I do, some people do it in groups, and that's okay too. There is no wrong way as long as you get perfect end results. Use the dodge tool and just very quickly go over some of the feathers. Don't overdo this, uh, a little bit on the hair. Love to have that feather show up a little bit more. There we go. Okay, and let's see a before and after. A little bit too, too little. So take out the protect tones. There we go. I still have that on accident on protect tones. And I never use the protect tones unless it's really important. There's, this works a lot better. There we go. So this is something that you, again, can also do in Lightroom, but this just works way more uh, precise way easier okay there we go now before and after and now you can really see that this part up here really shows up nice okay and flatten the image and close so this was the first image we've done and let's see if Nadine is ready and I think she actually is and we can do another shoot so that's gonna be awesome guys Okay, I'm going to open up Capture One again. But before that, one of the most important things, of course, is monitors. And one of our sponsors is actually BenQ. And I'm using their 27-inch monitor. It's an Adobe RGB monitor. And that's a pretty good monitor. And I want to show you a little clip we did for BenQ on their 27-inch. Now, in between, I got a new... Uh, let me see, new question. Have you tried the latest skin retouching method of Clean Duos? Also works pretty good and reserves skin textures. Yes, Johan, I tried. I really liked it. But it's something that um, I have to incorporate into my workflow. But I like the frequency separation just a little bit more. It gives me a little bit more control. But Glyn is one hell of an instructor and a great, great retoucher. So without any doubt, if Glyn says it works, it does work. He's really awesome. Okay, and let me see, have you tried color grading with LUTs in Photoshop and then changing the blend modes to create the look you like? Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean, but there are many, many different ways to change blend modes and play around with them. And I'm sure there will be many, many ways that I didn't try yet. You can always drop me an email and I'm always looking for new 
and enhanced stuff. Let me see another question. Uh, do you do something about the color of the hand as it looks so pink in comparison to the face? Okay, let me go there. Uh, you're absolutely right. And you can do something about that. Uh, let me go into Photoshop. Let me open up the last image. Uh, let me see where it is. Uh, let me go into... One moment, guys. Let me go into my external retouch capture one. And there we'll have a Nadine. Okay. So let's say that you want to change the color of the hand. And that's not really difficult. Let's zoom in. And you can see that it's a little bit different color. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Sorry, guys. It's dark. There we go. Now, what you can do is le let's create a new layer so you can easily see it. If it's a little bit too pinkish, what you can do is you can take your brush and put it on color mode. You sample the color that you like, for example here. You lower your opacity a lot and you just paint the effect in. There you go. Now the pinkiness is gone and it looks the same as your normal skin tone. So before and after. A really simple trick and very, very effective. Okay. And you were absolutely right. I missed that one. I'm only human. File close. Okay, so let me show you uh, the video for the BenQ and then we're going to do the next setup. Now these clips are of course commercials, but we also need them to set up stuff. So don't worry, it's not uh, to fill up time, it's just that you guys don't have to see us running around in the studio setting everything up. So the 27 inch BenQ, this is the monitor that I use and I highly recommend and it's like $6.99 and for that kind of quality it's amazing. So here we go and after that we do the second shoot. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorf and I want to tell you today about the new 27-inch monitor from BenQ. Now, I'm a fashion photographer and I like my colors to be as they are in real life. Because I do my best to light my scene correctly, to style the scene, to have great makeup, great model. And then I see my images on a monitor and they look like, well, very dull. Well, that can happen to you too and it will probably happen to you. You know the problem? Your monitor is not up to spec. Now, a monitor isn't a monitor, it's not something that just shows you the image. There are many different kinds of monitors, like TV sets, your very expensive ones, which will give you better image quality, right? Now, with computer monitors, we always tell people it's all about the color space. For example, you have an sRGB monitor, or for the professionals, an Adobe RGB monitor. But if you don't know what that means, it doesn't make any sense. Now, let me make it simple. These are the colors in real life. So this is what you capture, right? It's, it's great, it's vibrant, it's saturated, it's real life. Now, an sRGB monitor, it's a really small color space. And that's okay for the web or for a laptop or just simply browsing your images. But if you want those more vibrant colors, you need something a little bit bigger. And that's an Adobe RGB color space. It's just a bigger color space. But it also means that the monitor has to show those colors. Now, in the past, those monitors were pretty expensive, especially a 27-inch. And BenQ really, really made me enthusiastic about this monitor because it's very affordable. It's delivered with a hood. So, in other words, it will cut down on your glare. And it's, well, well I can give you all the bells and whistles about it. Like, it has all the inputs you need. It has all the specs. It's 99% Adobe RGB. But in the end, it all boils down to one thing image quality. And I'm very picky and as you can see it's my main editing monitor at the moment. So I'm very, very enthusiastic about the monitor. If you are looking for a great monitor and you want something in the 27 inch and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money on it, check out the new BenQ 27 inch. And for me the most important thing is that it has a hardware calibration option. Meaning you use their own software and you use a calibrator. And you can really make sure that the reds are as red as they are intended. Now, I know a lot of monitors come with this sheet, like, I'm calibrated in the factory. That's great, but it doesn't make any sense because your computer is different. So you have to recalibrate. Now, when do you recalibrate? I always recalibrate before a very important retouch session. For example, if I have to do a wedding or a fashion shoot, I will just let my monitor warm up for half an hour or an hour do the calibration and then I do my retouching. That way I know for sure that my colors are accurate. So BenQ, 
job well done. I'm very, very happy with the monitor. And you guys, if you're in the market for a new monitor, check out the new BenQ series because they're really knocking one out of the ballpark with this series. And we're back. Hey guys. So we have a next setup and we have Nadine on the floor with two chandeliers. Now, chandeliers? Yeah, chandeliers. You can just buy them on eBay or Marktplaats if you are in the Netherlands, which actually is an eBay company, but that's way too much information for now. And I'm talking way too fast because Anna Week made me cola. And I don't want to drink Coke during live shows because then I get really excited. That's the wrong term, by the way. But you know what I mean, right? So we have Nadine on the floor with two chandeliers. Now, one of the main problems when you use chandeliers is, of course, the light is coming from the bottom up, meaning that she really has to look down. Now, if I shoot up, or in other words, if I shoot from a higher angle down, she actually has to look at me and she will have dark eyes. So, of course, we can also use that light, but that will actually flood the scene with... Um, with light and I don't like that. So we just want to use the chandelier. So it means that I have to choose a lower angle to shoot. But most of all, I have to be careful about where I let my model look. Now we love all the flowers here. I love the lighting. I love the model styling. So I have to make sure that everything is in. And we have one light that actually died. And it worked like a minute ago and now it doesn't. So that's going to be awesome because in Photoshop, I'm going to show you how to turn on the lights. Saves you a lot of money and power, by the way. But at least you have some lights working. So we're going to use the light meter again. I'm going to do ISO 800. And I'm just going to see how much light is on my model in this case. So there we go, F4. And I can shoot this on a 30th of a second, F4. Now 30th of a second, that's a little bit tricky. So let's raise the ISO to 1000 to 1250. Now when I'm on 1250, I can use f4 on a 60th of a second so that's very very workable so we're going to crap the camera and we're going to go to iso 1250 a 60th of a second f4 so let's see if that works so we're going to go to 60th f4 and iso 1250 There we go. And let's try first one from the top down. So I'm going to shoot down. Really nice. You can see the chandeliers in. It's a pretty cool shot, but it's also a mess. You agree? You don't see the model. You don't see anything. It's, I don't know. It just, it sucks. So Nadine, can you look that way, please? Really nice. So let's see if we can make that a little bit better. Now by changing just the position of the face of the model, we already have a way more interesting shot. So this works a little bit better. I really like the mats on the floor. I really like that everything is nicely tied together. The only thing I don't like is, well, the position I'm shooting from. It's a little bit too high. So first I'm going to try even higher. So I'm going to go all the way here. I'm going to use the display on the back of my camera. And I didn't look there. That's really cool. That's nice. And use the zoom just a little bit. There we go. You don't always have to use your viewfinder. Sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. There we go. Now what I want to do is I actually want to go and sit on the floor and really shoot up. Now I can let my model look straight into the light and I can start again experimenting a little with my exposure. So I'm going to sit down. Really nice. Nadine looks straight at me. That's nice. And now the whole scene comes alive. This is way better. I love the gay, chaotic stuff in the background. Uh, sorry, in the foreground. And again, remember guys, I'm Dutch, so if I say something wrong... <laughs> I don't mean to offend you if I say something wrong, but if it's funny, it was meant that way. That's always the nice excuse. There we go. Awesome. And let's go even lower. Now we have that flip-up screen of the Sony, so I can go really low on the floor. Focus on the eyes of the model. Make the composition and shoot. 
try it again. I love the way the chandelier is up on the side, so let's enhance that a little bit by moving here. This is really nice. Because I'm shooting with a shallow depth of field, I have to be very picky with my focus. So if the model changes in between, I have to refocus. There we go. Love it. Okay, let's try with a little bit overexposure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my aperture from 4 actually down to 3.2. Give a little bit more light on the model's face. There we go. Maybe even go to a 30th of a second because I know I can handheld that. And now it's actually overexposing, giving it a little bit of a glowy look. Really nice. Almost high key. This is actually a little bit too much for my taste. So let's tone that down a little bit and raise the shutter speed to a 40th and maybe go to 3.5. So as you can see the light meter gave me the starting point but after that it's all creativity. It's in your mind what you want to do. It's your photo. There we go. Really nice Nadine. Focus on the eyes. Make the composition and shoot. I'm also going to show, do a few more from this angle. Now I'm using the viewfinder again. Now one of the nice things about the Sony is it has an EVF, meaning an electronic viewfinder. So in the viewfinder I can actually see the exposure perfectly. So I know exactly what I'm going to do. There we go. Now you think that we're done, right? Because it looks already cool. Now let's do this and then I will answer some questions. Let's just use the light bulbs, focus on my model, and just use it in the front, maybe even like this. Maybe a little bit higher. There we go, and one more. And the final one, which is never the final one. You already know that, right Nadine? And there we go. And the final, final, final one. Let's make sure that we have that one in focus. Awesome. And the final one. Okay, thank you very much Nadine. And we have a question. Yes, two questions. Okay, he said, I'm hearing that you use a very high ISO. It's actually not that high, it's 1250. So it's 1250, so that's below 1600. Because otherwise people think I'm using 12,500. It's, it's pretty low under ISO on normal modern day cameras. ISO 1600 is no problem at all. I remember that when I shot with the 20D from Canon, that was the first camera when I started using ISO 3200, I was going like, this is usable. Nowadays, ISO 3200, that's not even where the problems start. The problem starts at around 5000, 6400, depending on the light source actually. Because if you use it in tungsten light, you have a little bit more noise than if you use it outside for sports. So 1600 is no problem at all, and I'm still below 1600, so I'm at 1250. So no problem at all, it will be perfect images for publication, even big prints. Any other question, Daisy? Okay, now the question was why do I shoot it on a 30th or a 60th? Well, the 30th I can still handheld, I'm sure. The 60th, I'm very, very sure, but I have to make a choice. If I shoot it on a 60th, I will actually get above ISO 1600, I will go to 2500. When I shoot it on a 30th and I actually have it on the floor, I'm shooting relatively wide, so I sh I'm sure with a 30th of a second I can still handhold my camera without any problem. Now as soon as I go to the computer and I see that my images are out of focus, I will actually raise my shutter speed and have a little bit more noise. So the other question, Daisy. Okay, 
Now, somebody asked me like, oh, how fast is your camera? Because it shows up really fast on the screen and with my camera I have to wait a long time. First of all, and you can better email me about this, but let's start about, let's talk a little bit about tethering. What you do is you connect your camera to a computer and it will capture it. Now, Capture One is blazingly fast, but if you use the Lightroom tethering option, it should be blazingly fast too, where the problem comes if you start using hot folders. Now, let's say you have a camera that isn't supported into Lightroom and you use the software from your manufacturing on the background, so it will actually store all its files into a directory, and that directory is read by Lightroom, then copied into your tethering folder, and then shows the images. You see that it's a lot of steps. And that means that it will take you a long time to see your images. With Capture One, and if you use native Lightroom tethering, it should be, press the button, and it should be there. Now with Wi-Fi, of course, it takes a lot longer. So with Wi-Fi, we only shoot JPEGs on the card. Of course, there are RAWs, but the JPEGs are transported over the sky. Over the sky? via Wi-Fi. So that's very easy to explain. Now, if you still have trouble with your capturing, make sure that you first try another cable. We use the Terra Tools cables because they're orange and I'm Dutch and they're very, very good. Now, we once did a cutout from the Terra Tools cable on our social media and you see that the Terra Tools is way thicker and totally different constructed than a normal USB cable. But still try two different cables. If you see a difference, go for the Tether Tools cable. If the Tether Tools cable is very slow and your original cable is very fast, check if the cable has no, um, how do you call it? Damage. 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 I wanted to say broken, but that's Dutch. So damage. Okay, so we're going to retouch some of those images and, oh, Daisy, we have another question. Yes? Uh, is DPF the reason to use Sony instead of Nikon or Canon? Is EVF the reason to shoot with Sony instead of Nikon or Canon? No. And yes. And a week was already going, yes, yes, EVF, we love EVF. Yes, we do. The first time I shot with the Sony Alpha 99, I hated EVF. It was the only thing I couldn't get my answer. It was awful. And then you start getting the picture and you go like, hmm, this really is cool because I can now see what you see is what you get. Now, if you're shooting in, uh, Sony and you have the problem that you don't see anything in the studio, you go blind with, oh my God, I don't see anything, it's black. Go into your menu, there's an option, it's called image setting. And you have to put it on on instead of off. Now, if you put it on on, it's what you see is what you get. If you put it on off, you will see the OVF simulation. Or in other words, you see the image always coming in and it's always right. If you use it on on, this is what you see is what you get. So if you're walking outside and you see a cool shot, you can just simply use your exposure compensation dial it in until you see in the viewfinder what you like and then press the shutter. In the studio it's dark, so if you're shooting on f16, 125th, ISO 100, it will be totally black because what you see is what you get, right? Not completely, because as soon as you press the shutter the strobes will go off and you will have a lot of light. So that's why you can also turn the EVF in the normal, we always call it the OVF mode. But that's not the only reason I'm shooting Sony. The most important reason is the image quality from the sensors. The sensors are absolutely breathtakingly cool. You have a lot of dynamic range, the colors are really cool, and most of all, the glass. Zeiss autofocus lenses. And the other thing is, and then we're going to stop about Sony, you have this converter in here. And in this case, it makes it possible to mount my A-mount or Minolta glass on my A7R2. But you can also get converters for M42, the old screw lenses. And most of all, and those lenses I really, really like, are the Leica R lenses. So I love Leica R. The M's I can't afford, but the R's are really cool. So I use all those old lenses on my camera. So how do you manual focus? That's again where the EVF comes in. As soon as you focus and you have something in focus, it will turn up yellow. You can of course turn that off or change the colors, but it will turn up yellow, making out of focus really cool, but manual focus really easy. So let's see from these images which we're going to retouch and what we're going to do in Photoshop to really get some more nice images from this and how to turn that one light on. So I'm going to go back to the computer, going to kick Daisy out and we're going to do some retouching and in between Nadine is going to change into something more comfortable or something different at least for the next shot. Okay, so it's already here. Okay, very cool. 
And we're going to show you one more video in between that I'm going to switch. And this is about our new video on location. And that's when I'm going to read up on all your questions, which I'm going to ask answer in a moment. So let's go live to our video on location. <laughs> Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorov and I'm the author of the book Mastering the Model Shoot. And you guys really like the book because we get a lot of emails with questions about topics in the book. And I thought, what is the best companion to a book? And that's video, right? Because then you can see what we're doing. So our first video was all about the light meter. The second video is all about a topic that's really difficult for a lot of photographers. Shooting on location. Because, let's be honest, there's so much going on. You have the location, you have the model, you have public. What gear do you bring? What stories do you want to tell? How do you shoot something? How do you... Well, there are so many questions. It's impossible to just tell you everything we're going to do in the video in a trailer. So, we made a video while traveling the UK and Scotland with two models, Lena and Nadine. And I'm going to show you how to shoot with, for example, the Ellen Boom Quadra. I'm going to show you how to shoot with small strokes, which modifiers to use what a grid does, how to coach your model, and way, way more. And we even included two full retouch sessions. So if you want to shoot on location and you want to go from OK to WOW, you want to master your model shoot, then watch this video, On Location, Mastering the Model Shoot, video two. Okay guys, so I'm behind the computer and let's make the selection. Now the first image you see is actually the one which we took at first. Yeah, the that's obvious, right? And as you can see here, the face is way too dark. So I'm going to take that one out. Now here I made my model look towards the light. The exposure is okay, but because we're using weird kind of lighting, it's actually not that nice on our face. So let's take that one out too. Now this was the higher position. Now what I don't like about this shot is actually this area over here. It's too empty, so let's take that one out. By zooming in, I actually make that worse, as you can see here. So that's why a high position didn't work. Zooming in even more makes it a little bit better, but it doesn't make any sense anymore, because where's all the beautiful styling? So here we go. And one more from the top, and now we went down. Now this looks totally different. This is where it starts getting interesting. But it's, well, this is okay. Let's go a little bit further. Don't like this one for your expression. I like this one. I like this one. This one is okay. But I know there are better ones because this is all with our standard lighting. So we didn't overexpose anything yet. And at one point, you remember, I started overexposing. And that's when things started to get really interesting. Like here. There we go. This is a little bit too much. Now, don't worry if you see something like this with modern day cameras. You just go into here and you just draw back the highlights. And you can actually save a whole image. So don't worry if it happens. There's so much dynamic range in modern day cameras, you can easily get it back. I actually love this shot. So let's tone it down. There we go. Let's give this one five stars. Okay. As soon as I went more down on the floor, don't like that one, it got much more interesting. Now, this one is also pretty cool, but this is a little bit too much on our arms. I can probably not recover that. Oh, wow. I can. Sometimes my camera even surprises me. So let's give that five stars. 
Okay, there we go. Now it's getting more interesting. I really like this. The thing is, I have to crop this out. So I will give it five stars, but let's see if we have something better. There we go. Love this shot. Love this one better. This is awesome. This is even better. This is the last series, and so now you can see that we're really getting into the into the setting. Okay. Let me see if that one is sharp. Ah, that's a shame. That one isn't. Okay. So let's go all the way back. So let's see what we selected. We selected this one, which is nice. But I like this one better. So we're gonna take this one out. Zero. Okay. I don't know which one I like. I like the hand in this one more. So let's see if this one is in focus because I was really pushing the boundaries a little bit of the focus. So there we go. Yes, this one is okay. Let me see for this one. And this one is also okay. So I'm going to pick the other one. So I'm going to zero this one. I really love this one. Checking focus. This one is awesome. So this is the one we're going to retouch. And then finally we have this one. Which is a shame because this one is out of focus. But normally if the model is still there, you can still do the shoot. So this is very important why you should always check your focus while you're doing the shoot. Because then you can still try to do the same shot again. And as you can see now, we're doing digital classroom and everything goes really, really fast. This is already the third set we're doing. And I'm doing the retouching and we're only like one hour and ten minutes in. Normally we will take for one shot like this approximately one hour. So a lot more time. So let me see, we are having some questions in. Hi, this is Petra. On what mode do I set my Saconic Light Meter meter in this kind of light? You set it on the sun mode, the little sun, and you actually set it on aperture priority, meaning the F has to be active. And then it will give you the shutter speed you need for the desired ISO. Uh, another question from Johan. A while ago you showed in one of your Kelby One videos how to recalibrate your light meter. Can you show this on a further digital classroom again? Uh, Johan, we have a video for that called the light meter. That's the video I really advise for that. I don't do the calibration in Digital Classroom. That's something for the commercial videos. We do have to keep some stuff which is for the commercial videos, of course. Uh, Hans asks me, could you tell something on setting color temperature related to light bulbs? Yes, we normally use a color checker or a white balance card for that. But in this case, because we are messing around with the images, we don't use a color checker at the moment. Because I like to have these images a little bit tinted. And another question, you have to turn one of these in black and white. Okay, let's do this one in color and black and white, just because you guys like it. Okay, so the first thing I do in Capture One is just lower the highlights just a little bit. Not too much, because I like that glowing effect. Actually, I like it a lot. And let, let me tone it down only on the skin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm going to paint only on the skin. So let's take a brush and draw a mask on the skin. And there we go. And again, it's lagging because we are recording everything also and screen sharing. So normally Capture One is really fast, but now it's really laggy. I hope that's the correct term. Okay, let's only turn the highlights down there. There we go. A little bit of exposure. Okay, cool. So the effect is you don't want to overdo this. You just want to make it barely noticeable. There we go. Now let's make it a little bit more here. And let it blend over to this side. There we go. And now we're going to use the eraser. Over here. Okay. Let's make the eraser a little bit bigger, bigger and take it out a little bit here. Cool. Okay, let's go into Photoshop. Now in this case, Command D will open this image up in Photoshop. And again, you can do this also in Lightroom, of course, with your local adjustment brush, which is really cool. I always love local adjustments because then you can actually change to your heart's content what you would like to change. Okay, so first go to 100% and go to the healing brush. Now take out 
Uh, somehow today my healing brush doesn't do what I wanted to do. It has something to do with the noise, I think. So let's change to the normal old-fashioned healing brush. There we go. That always works. So you can always switch between those two. They're still there, so why not use them both? Let's take this one out a little bit. Now, while I'm retouching, I can't see the question. So guys, if you have a question, don't worry. I will be with you as soon as we do something where I can turn my head to see the questions. Yeah, really nice. Don't be too sloppy with this. I'm now a little bit more sloppy than normally because I want to save some time for you guys to show you guys a lot of stuff. Now, Portrait Smooth is an action I created. Now, what does the action do? It duplicates my current layer, it runs image-nomic portraiture, it selects my layer, and it will make a mask. So, meaning it will shave off a lot of time. So, there we go. We run the action. It's now running portraiture. It's creating my layer. I just have to take a brush with white paint. Uh, of course, the opacity has to be all the way up. And there we go. I'll just paint the effect in. And again, don't overdo this. You don't want Barbie dolls. You still want some skin detail there. You just want to even it out a little bit. And especially around hairs, watch out, because this can be really, really nasty. And if I have to choose between seeing pores and seeing no pores, well, I always want to see some pores in the skin. Okay. So let me see if she also had legs in the picture. <laughs> Don't forget the legs. There we go. fit on screen. Now in this case I don't have to show you how to turn on the light because the light isn't here. But Let me see if I can show you that in another picture. The only thing I do see what I don't like, I do like the chain but I don't like this orange stuff. So this is where we're going to use content aware fill. Now content aware fill is really nice but let me show you how it works on a new layer. Because you can make a new layer and you can go into quick mask that's under here take the brush and just do a quick masking of the orange. There we go. Nice. Now deselect the quick mask and do a select inverse. Now normally if you press delete or uh, backspace it will ask you do you want content to wear fill but I'm now on my top layer and not on my background layer. So what I have to do now is actually go into edit and then go into fill. And now you can do content aware with color adaption, the normal thing you do. And press OK. And it always works pretty good. It's not perfect, but it works like a charm. The only thing I now have to do is make sure that this part is gone. The first thing I always do is do it with the healing brush. I'll just try to smoothen it out and see if it works. And the healing brush is actually not quite often used as a clone tool. But sometimes I do it and it gives me various results that are actually pretty usable. So I never did this up until a few weeks ago when I started doing it with a healing brush. And it just gives me a little bit more natural looking images compared to the clone tool. There we go. Now this part, it's actually not that obvious. It looks like it's part of the shot, so just leave it in. Don't do too much. There we go. And fit on screen. Pretty nice. Okay. So, what is next? The next thing, of course, is again my image. Oh, sorry, that we already did. Is of course my tonal. Um, yes, yeah, sure. My MacFun intensify. Sorry, guys. So make a duplicate layer. Go into filter. Go into your MacFun creative kit and go into intensify. Uh, one moment, we get a question from Anoeek. Anoeek, what's wrong? Seems like the stream is offline. Okay, the stream is offline, uh, Anoeek says, but I have still a good health over here. So see if your internet is still working, Anoeek. Okay. Some people are experienced that the sound is gone and back again. Again, guys, if you're watching on YouTube, just refresh. Because we still have a stream that's good. We have more than enough bandwidth. So there should be no problem at all with you guys. And otherwise, don't worry, we're still recording this on the hard drive. So if something goes wrong, no problem. 
Okay, the question is, would a plugin like Topaz Labs Glow be nice for a photo like this, or would it be too much? It depends on your style. Some people like to Instagram the heck out of an image. I don't like that that much, but I do like Topaz Glow, but very, very, uh, very subtle. And in this kind of image, you could do it, but I don't think it's cool for this image. Now, another question, her eyes are a bit red on this picture. Can you show us how to proceed to retouch that? Yes, I'm going to show you that in a moment. Don't worry, we're going to do it all. Okay, so first let's make the image pop a little bit. Again, we're going to use the Poppy Drama 3. And I don't like the vignetting in this one. So you can go into your adjust and actually take out the vignetting. That's the cool thing about, Topa uh, sorry, about Mac Fun. It's really customizable. There we go. So now you have a before and after. It really gives more depth to the flowers and to the background. I don't like it in the face again and I don't like it on everything. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a layer mask and I'm actually going to hide the whole effect. Okay, there are some people in the north of the Netherlands that have problems with their internet. Yeah, guys, but you also have a lot of snow over there and actually the whole Netherlands is shut down at the moment due to the, I don't know how you call it, wet snow, ISIL. So we actually saw a joke this morning which was pretty cool uh, because I'm doing my, uh, at the moment I'm doing a theoretical uh, learning for a different driver's license and one of the guys actually joked around on my website and he said, Frank, there's a car coming from the left and a skater from the right, which one has the right of way? So it's that bad, guys. They're actually skating on the roads where you normally drive your cars. It's like <laughs> ridiculous, but it's really cool. Okay, so let's hide all and just paint the effect in, in the areas where we want. So we have a black uh, canvas, so we're actually going to use white paint. I'm just going to paint it like Bob Ross. The flowers are coming alive. And I love Bob Ross, uh, Bob Ross by the way, so don't worry, I'm not making fun of him. But he was funny. There we go. I really love the effect. Do you see what it does here with the lens flare? You didn't even see it before. And now it just brings it in. Really, really cool. I think on 99% of my shots, there's some Intensify Pro going on. Because it's just, and it's very, very subtle sometimes. And sometimes it's a little bit more like here. We're going to go for the subtle look. But as soon as I turn it off, you will see that it really has a huge impact. Okay, so this is before. And this is after. Really nice. Okay, give it a little bit more here. And just take your time with this. I, I won't today, but normally take your time with this. Okay, so let's do a flatten image. I like it this way. Now let's fix that redness in her eyes. So go to 100%. And as you can see here, it's a little bit red. So I'm first going to make a new layer. And what you can do is very simple. You go here into your sponge tool and you go into desaturate. And you go into your flow on 100% and just go down. And there we go. That's one solution, but now you can see that it's a little bit, well, it's a little bit too dark. So now you can actually go into your dots tool and just once or twice dab on it. Now that's one solution and that's the solution I don't like. So let's undo this. Okay, make a new layer. What I like more is the following. It's adjustments. Sorry. First make this layer uh, blind. Go to the bottom layer. Go to image adjustments and do U saturation. And just turn down the saturation. And bump the lightness. And just try to remember how it looked. There we go, press OK. Activate the top layer and now do a layer, layer mask, reveal all. What you're now going to do is you're going to use black paint. You're going to paint the effect in. And now you have way more control. And just do it all around the eyes. So, there we go. And now on the bottom part, you can start fine-tuning. So now I activated the bottom part. Now I can add a little bit saturation back in. 
and I can actually also use curves. So image adjustment curves and just pull it up until it's white. There we go and give it a little bit of contrast back. Awesome. Okay, so do a layer flatten image. Now I just want to have the irises pop a little bit more. So take your uh, dodge tool, put it on highlights and only go over the irises. There we go. Don't overdo this, just a little bit. Don't make it like a Barbie doll. And the sound you hear on the back, trust me guys, this is going to be awesome because they're setting up the new set and it's going to be cool. And again, I want to have a little bit of toning in this image. So let's go into filters, let's go into DxO film pack because I want some subtle toning in this one. Okay, let's go to almost natural. That really always pops. And let's see a before and after. Oops, okay, just updated. Oops, not like that. There we go. Before and after. It's a little bit too much for me. It's a little bit too hyper. Okay. Ooh, the blue mood. This is actually pretty cool. Let's go to bright vintage. That's nice. But I want a little bit more standard. That's okay. The color change, that's also that's also nice. Let's go to something I love to use. And if you see me more, you know exactly where I'm going now. To the red pop. There we go, this is awesome. I love reds. And as you can see also in the skin tones, this is way better. So I love this one. And press save. Okay. So you also wanted to see how we do this in black and white. Okay, no problem. Oh, it's called Icy Rain. Yes, that's what it's called indeed. And in southern Holland, it's like the Bahamas. Yeah, Riker, sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, file, save. And now let's go into black and white. Now, one of the things that I love about Mac Fun is that they also have a very cool black and white conversion. So go into filters and then go into Mac Fun and go into their tonality. Now, this is without a doubt my favorite black and white converter. Now, if you don't have a Mac, you can also use, of course, DxO Film Pack or Alien Skin Exposure X for some really cool black and white conversions. But on the Mac, I think Mac Fun with their uh, tonality and Intensify, it's a really cool suite. Now, the fun thing is you can also still include color. Like if you use this preset, this preset, you can actually see what we've done with this. And it looks pretty funky, by the way. And somehow I also like this one. It's not really a Frank Doroff shot, but it's pretty cool. Hmm. You know that feeling when sometimes everything comes together. And of course you can change the luminosity of red. Let's take it a little bit down and go into saturation of reds and just pump up that reds. Wow. Okay, we're going to make three versions of this one. Yeah. <laughs> I take down the glow and the whole image will fall down there, you see. Okay, it really depends on the glow. Okay, there we go. Just press apply. So I'm going to make three versions of this one and then let the guys online in a moment just decide which one they like best. So it's now processing. That takes a little bit of a time and then I'm going to do the black and white, don't worry. So let me see if we have a question in between. It's all about the icy snow and no further questions. Okay, that's cool. I hope you guys are having fun. I know Nadine is having fun. She's sitting down at the moment. Nadine, I love your outfit. It's awesome. Do you want to see it very quickly, guys, while it's being rendered? So I'm going to show you very quickly. But the camera is on the floor, so it won't look nice. So if you can pick it up, there we go. Very quickly, guys, this is how it's going to look in a moment. But yeah, okay, we're going to go back to me. There we go. <laughs> awesome, right? Okay, let's save this too. Now make sure that you do save as, because otherwise, well, you actually overwrite the one you already did. So we're going to do this as our semicolor, SC, semicolor. Cool. And we do, uh, yeah, sure. Do it like that. Okay, so edit, step backward, and now we're going to do a real black and white. So we're going to go into MacFun tonality. And there we go, it's starting the plugin. And it starts off as black and white, of course. And now let's fine tune this. 
Okay, the first thing I always do is play with my contrast. I like to add a little bit of contrast here and it already looks a lot better. Now, of course, you can tone down your highlights or add them. In this case, I will tone them down a little bit because I want to use glow. Add a little bit of mid-tones. As you can see here. I always do it in extremes and then just tone it down. And you can do the same with the shadows. Don't overdo it. There we go. Okay, now go into your clarity and just skip that because we already used uh, intensify. Now still, on the luminance you can change your reds. So make it really poppy like this. And the saturation, but we did this before so we don't do that again. But in saturation you can bring certain colors back. As you can see here, like the greens, cyan, and of course the reds. So that's pretty nice. Of course we have the tone curve, we're not, go not gonna do anything like that. You have split toning, which I'm not gonna do now. But I just wanted to show you what's possible. And here we go, the glow. Now just give it a little bit of glow. There we go. And of course we have lens blur. Now let let's go overboard, let's do lens blur, why not? Place the center on our face. And now the first thing I always do is overdo it. Change the radius all the way small. Change the transition. So now I have it over. Now I've overdone it. Now I will start at zero, and I will gradually build it up until I see what I like. I really like this. So there we go. You can do a texture overlay, which I never ever use because I don't like it that much. But if you want, it's really cool. Watch this. So you can actually do like this texture, and you can use metal textures. And somehow it's. Oh wait a minute! I know what's going wrong. I of course have to put the amount in, there we go. So you can create something that's a little bit more old fashioned looking, a little bit more vintage. But again, it's not really my thing, but it, it's there. If you like it, be free to use it. It's free. Okay, the vignetting. Do we need vignetting here? Maybe a little bit more white like this, a little bit of a white out. Normally I will use black, in this case I think white is better. Now grain is incredibly important in a black and white image. Now some people will say, I don't want any noise in my image. Dude, it's not noise, it's grain. Noise is something bad, grain is something cool. So what I will do is I will start up all the way up. Now this is way too much. So I will gradually build it down. I will add a little bit of softness to the grain and add some contrast. And this really makes it pop out. So if you look at without grain and with, you can see that it just gives it a little bit more of an organic look, which I really like, especially if you didn't nail the focus 100% correct, this will actually give the viewer the idea that it's totally in focus. Now what I will do is I will go all the way up and I will finish it off with my contrast. So now we'll start adding the final contrast, even use a little bit of smart contrast maybe. There we go. Change the highlights just a little bit. This is all personal. I really like this. And just press apply. Very cool. Let me see if we have any questions. Uh, somebody who says, I love to go to more workshops. Yes, I totally agree. Workshops are always cool. Uh, somebody who says, because my school is closed down, I can finally see this. Yes, Arnold. My son is also here because his school is closed down. I think it's ridiculous, but okay. <laughs> uh, somebody says, uh, the image is frozen, just refresh Petra, because uh, you also lost some audio. I think you have a problem with your internet, because we have no problems at all here with the stream, so it should be 100%. Okay, so this is our black and white. Wow, really love this one, very powerful. So we do save as, and we're gonna use this as a name as BNW, black and white. There we go, black and white. Okay, I promised you guys to show you how to turn on a light bulb. So Nadine, are you still comfortable? I hope so, because this is going to take a little bit longer. Close. Okay, let's go back to capture one and select one where you can actually see that one of the lights is not working, like this one. Okay. And that one was actually out of focus, so don't take that one, because then you guys think I can't shoot. There we go. So the light is off, right? Okay, there we go. Let's go into Capture One, Command D. And I won't do the whole retouching, I will do that later on after the episode. I'm just gonna turn the light on. Now, of course, you can copy it from this one, but it's way more fun to do it totally manually. 
So go into layer, create a new layer, and zoom in. Go to 100%. There we go. Zoom out a little bit so you can see what you're doing. Oops. Go to 100% and zoom out just a little bit. There we go. That's nice. Now take a brush and sample the color here. Now don't automatically say it's white because you don't know for sure. Of course it's white but just sample it so you know absolutely sure that you're doing it right. And now just paint it in. Yes it's that easy but we're not done yet of course. Now it's on color mode so that's why it's not so nice. So let's change it back to normal. Okay, and it's not 100% white, I think. There we go, that's 100% white. But as you can see, the other light bulbs are a little bit glowy. So what you do is you actually use filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And you don't overdo it, you just do it a little bit. Let's gradually build it up. There you go. And now the only thing you do is just use your layer mask, reveal all, and just paint away the bottom part. And there we go. You go here, use your adjustment curves. I still have the feeling it's not 100% white, but my computer says differently, so it should be okay. Now if you want to have a little bit more glow, like these ones, now the stars you have to clone. Let's say you want a little bit more glow, you just go into new layer, you go here, you take a big brush of white paint, and what you actually do is you do this. And you blur it a lot. So you go to blur, Gaussian blur, and just go to a lot of blur. There we go. Now that one we call the a uh, atmospheric effect or whatever you want to call it. And it really gives you that nice glow. Go back to your bottom layer, take a black brush and just fine tune your light bulb. So now it looks like the light bulb is on again. Okay, anyway, so you can do this for also car headlights or whatever you want to do. So file close and don't save because this was not by far not good enough. Okay, Nadine is ready for her next set. So I'm going to do a next photo shoot. But before that, of course, we have to change sets. So I'm going to do a very quick viewing for you guys again from one of the videos and this video is actually about a safari and of course from one of our sponsors BenQ and again we do these videos because then we can really set up everything and we don't have to bother you guys with us walking around and of course it's the support that these sponsors give us that make it possible to uh, give this stuff to you guys for free okay one problem in between uh, sorry one question in between uh, amazing work of Nadine great posing and beautiful styling uh, yes, she is amazing. She's really one of the best, I think. And let me see. Um, if you like Nadine and me and you live in the UK, actually on June 4th and 5th, we have workshops in the UK. And I'm going to show you in a moment uh, where you can find more information about that. But that will be June 4th and 5th. And of course, we'll be in New York on February 13th. You don't want to miss that one. But I'm going to show you that after this uh, Next photo shoot, and we're back. So, yeah, final setup for this set. Now, look at this. This is going to be very, very difficult to shoot because this is really low on light. As you can see, there's hardly any light. So, how are you going to do this? Well, I can't do this with a light meter because I don't use any light source at the moment. I only have these 
little things in the back. I can of course do something with the light meter, but this is way better to just drop the camera on auto ISO, choose, choose the lowest setting on your shutter speed that you're comfortable with, and just shoot it. And I'm now going to shoot it on 3.2. I'm not going to shoot it on 2.8, but on 3.2 I know from this lens that it's razor sharp. Now there's one thing guys, and I'm very sorry for this, but for this setup I have to turn off our main light. So it's going to be dark, but listen to my voice. And just watch Nadine. So let's turn this off. There we go. Oh my, this is really dark. So if you want to see how the high ISO performance of your camera is, do something like this. Okay, Nadine, are you ready? Look straight into the light. And on ISO 5000. It works pretty well. And ISO 5000 is okay. There won't be a lot of problems. Really nice. Let me see if the images are coming in. Yes, they are. I love this. Really cool. Nice. Can you look all the way to the side? A little bit more with your nose. Yes, there we go. I didn't like the nose shadow that much. Chin up just a little bit. Really nice. And although I'm shooting auto ISO and manual mode, I can still change my exposure compensation with the Sony. So I can let in more ambient light. And that's because I'm shooting auto ISO. So I'm now on ISO 16000. And this will be noisy. This is a little bit overexposed. So I'm going to go down a little bit. Still a little bit overexposed. So go down a little bit more. As you can see, this is pretty tricky because the camera also responds to the flickering lights. So this is just go with the flow. And thanks to the EVF, I can exactly see what I'm doing. And now know I'm a little bit overexposed. And as soon as the image comes in, you can see it. I'm now underexposed. It just depends on when the lights are flickering. Awesome. And because we have flickering lights, I'm actually going to do something else. I'm just going to go to my manual ISO. So I'm going to go... And I'm just going to point my camera towards Nadine, and I'm just going to put it on the ISO where I think it's nice. So ISO 8000 looks pretty cool. And again, this is one of the main advantages of having an EVF. Or you can do it if you have a Canon or Nikon, you can do it on your live view on the back of your camera. But in the viewfinder, oh, that's a nice pose, Nadine, keep that way. Really nice, keep it that way. Awesome, don't move. Really nice. Let's do a lower angle shot again. It's because we love them. Cool. And I'm going wider and wider. That's really nice. Okay, let's say that we really like this one, but we want to add an element. I want to give Nadine something to work with, so let's pick up the ice light from Westcott. Yes, you have a question. That was the question. That was the question. Yes. So I'm going to turn on the light so you can actually see what we're going to do. Hello Nadine. A lot of light. Now this is... Use the force, Luke. Sorry. Uh, this is of course the ice light from Westcott. Now I will turn it on. What? Yes, I, I know. There it goes. You have to hold it a little bit. So the ice light. Yeah. Pretty cool, but a lot of light. So we have to tone that down. You can actually make it dim. And what you can do is always buy it with the barn doors. I will really close down the bar doors. And what you can do is let's turn off this light so you can guys can see very good. Now I promised you guys we're going to do all cheap stuff today. This one isn't cheap, but it's pretty cool. So now what you can do is really light your model. And because I use the barn doors, I can really give it only on our eyes. As you can see here. So this is pretty nice. Feather it away a little bit from the, the owl. 
there we go. So I need an assistant for now. So Brian, can you come in the set, please? Or Brian is gone. Okay, in a week we'll do it. And I just want it on her eyes. There we go. That's really awesome. Aim it just a little bit up on a week. There we go. That's nice. Okay, now I can actually drop down my ISO and make it a little bit less noisy. Let's go to 4000. Really nice. And I'm actually mixing now two light sources, so her face will be very white and all the other light sources will be really nice and warm. You can even close the barn doors a little bit more on a week. Just make it a little bit of light. And now do it a little bit harder. Turn up the light. Yeah, turn it up a little bit more. Yeah, okay. There we go. Awesome. Chin up just a little bit, Nadine. And then we go a little bit lower. Yes, there we go. Just light her whole face. There we go. Awesome. Now, if you also want to light her clothing, that's no problem at all. And then we can you keep it like a strip light, so up instead of. Yes, there we go. And just make it over. Yes, there we go. That's nice. It's like there's opening a door of magic. And then we make sure that her whole body is lit a little bit more to the left. Yes, there we go. That's nice. Okay, I'm going to lower the ISO even more. So I went from 8000 to now 1600. And it still works. Now I'm losing a little bit of the lights on the background. So I'm going to mix this in. So Anna, we can you turn down the light a little bit? I'm going to give a little bit more ISO. So let's go to 3200. Okay, aim it straight at her face again and her body. A little bit more to the left. There we go. That's nice. This is cool. Okay, Nadine, do your best with some poses. Center your eyes, because we don't want the walking dead eyes with a lot of white. Awesomeness. This is really cool. Let's do some in portrait mode. That's nice. Cool. Love it. Okay, now, of course, you can also... Oh, that one we still have to shoot. Of course, you can also let your model play with this. Can you hold it yourself? And just light yourself with it. Now, this is way too much. Annemie, can you turn down the volume of uh, the power? Just turn it all the way down. Okay. Really nice. Okay, also show the other. Yes, that's nice. Just start playing with it. That's really cool. Okay, open up the barn doors just a little bit. There we go. Awesome. That's nice. Okay, let's zoom in. Okay, look up towards me. Okay, can you hold the ice light above your head like this? Awesome, really cool. I will always tell my model that it's awesome or really cool because if she knows that she's doing well, she will actually start behaving more and more powerful in front of the light. So never tell your model this doesn't work or this isn't cool. Always tell her she's doing amazing stuff. Nadine, you're amazing, and I really mean it, <laughs> really, really nice. Okay, that's a little bit too dark on your face, so focus towards the light, chin down. Nose a little bit more towards the light, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, stop. That's awesome. Okay, zoom in again, and the final shots. One of the final shots, another one of the final shots, and one more. Really nice. Okay, in between we have a question. Daisy asked the question. Yes, if you switch, uh, you mean, okay. 
I can change my position over here. I think they mean that. And look straight into the light again, maybe. And tilt your nose that way. Really cool. And we'll do some in portrait mode, so you can also see your dress. That's nice. Wow. Nadine, you rock. Okay, do one from a really low angle. I'm going to use the flip-up screen again. It's like a fairy tale, really nice. And the final one. Okay, thank you very much, Nadine. You rock. Okay, so let's see what we can do in Photoshop with this. Because we're almost out of time. Time flies. Okay, so let's go to Photoshop. Okay, so of course first I'm in Capture One for selecting the images. Now this image I really like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check very quickly if the focus is okay. And that's pretty okay. So I'm going to select this one. And of course it's not as good as it is on ISO 100 because ISO 100 will always be sharper, will always be better, but it has to be acceptable. And in the end it's all about the picture. So this was without the ice light. And as you can see, it's pretty interesting, but it isn't alive. And that's because we use only the Christmas tree lighting. And of course, this is totally overblown. And that's because we don't have any light on our model. So this was to be expected. And that's why we added a separate light source. So as soon as you will see this, this is all okay, but it isn't working per se. So as soon as we start adding the ice light in a moment, you can see that it really makes the difference. And of course you can also use other sources like you can use a tungsten light bulb or you can use a small, uh, uh, let me say a desk light or whatever, but in this case we used the ice light. Now as soon as you see this, this is when it starts to work. I immediately love this shot. I like this one better. Oh sorry, forgot to mention that one. There we go. This one is even better. I love the owl in the top. This one is incredibly cool. We have way too many images, guys. So, let me see. This one is really nice, but I think this is a little bit too much of the scene. Awesome. And as soon as the model starts playing herself, you can see that you get way more interesting stuff. Of course, the ice light is in the picture, but that's not a bad thing, you know, because then you can actually see your light source. And it makes a pretty cool, interesting uh, commercial shot. And if you do something like this, always send it to the manufacturer of the device. You never know if they're going to use it. And actually, I once sent images to Ellingrom for the D-lights, and look what happened to me. Ellen Grom started to really like those images and I'm shooting a lot of images for Ellen Grom. And that's all because I just took a shot of the D-lights and just sent them in. So you never know how, if when we say in the Netherlands, how a cow catch, captures a rabbit. And that probably won't make any sense to anybody outside of the Netherlands. But it means you never know how something's going to happen. Love this shot too. Ooh, lower angle really works here. Really cool. Okay, let's go to the five star images. And let's see. Still love this one, but I like that one better, so this one will get a zero. I like that one even more, although, well, I don't know. I'll just keep them both. I don't like that one anymore. Love that one. This one is pretty awesome. No, I don't like the expression here. I love this one. This one is even better. No, I keep them both. One moment. I will tell you in a moment why. I like this one because of the hand, and this one she's holding it with both. So here can, you can see her eyes, and here the ice light is a little bit better, but 
we'll keep them both. And this one is actually the best of them all. And remember, you don't have to overdo your shots. Don't keep six or seven shots because people will remember the one that they like the most and they will remember the one they don't like. So make sure that you don't include the one they don't like. Only do the ones that they like. So be very, very uh, cruel to your own images. Delete them and only select what you like, what you really like, sorry. Okay, so these are all pretty cool. Okay, so let me see. Uh, let's just start by retouching this one because this one has a problem area. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, using a gray card is useless here for white balance. No, it's not, but I don't use gray cards here because as I explained before, I love to work with my colors later in Photoshop. So that's why I don't use a color checker or gray card in this case. Um, Emily says, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, you see what you can do with really funky and cheap stuff. And actually it's all also because of Nadine. Trust me, if you put a model there in jeans and tank top, it won't make any sense at all. Another one asks, uh, Johan is that, what if you don't have a background like the red one you're using right now and you have a black background, for example? Can you change anything concerning lighting? If you don't have a background like this, create one. Very, very simple. This won't work against the black background because the background actually works with you. Uh, how to catch a rabbit? There comes the monkey out of the sleeve. Yes, Peter. <laughs> Some <laughs> don't translate very well. Okay, let's go. We're going to make a new layer in this case in our raw converter and in Lightroom you can use your adjustment brush. So create a new layer, go into the draw mask. There we go. And what I have to do is I have to make sure that my highlights are a little bit toned down here. And if you just tuned in, Capture One is a little bit lagging and that's because we are broadcasting live and doing screen recordings and screen sharings with CamTwist and then it can be a little bit laggy. But normally Capture One is really fast with this kind of stuff. There we go. And just drop the highlights. Don't drop it too much because that looks unnatural because it should blow out, but it shouldn't blow out like this. So just drop it down. There we go. And it's amazing what you can get back with modern cameras. Awesome. Okay, there we go. So go into Photoshop. Command D from Capture One or Command E if you're using Lightroom. Okay. There we are. Go to 100%. Looks pretty nice. First, of course. And again, this doesn't work with a uh, healing brush like this. So use the old fashioned one. Just sample and take out the first stuff. There we go. Okay, this is a little bit of a mess with all the hairs. So we're going to take that out first by healing. I don't clone, this is the healing brush, because the healing brush is way better for this kind of stuff. The clone tool will always show you oh, some patterns and it just doesn't look right. We're going a little bit over time, I hope you guys don't mind. It will be a little bit over time. And if you have to go because you have an appointment, don't worry. We are recording this and you can watch it back later. So again, do the uh, portrait smooth action. This is image nomic run on the background, creating a new layer so I can paint the effect in. And again, this is not really an in-depth Photoshop course. It's just showing you guys how we work in our studio and hope you guys are having fun with it and learning something in between. But if you want to go really in-depth, we of course have our instructional videos. And of course on Kelby One we have courses and of course our workshops. Okay, as you can see here, the effect isn't really what I want. So in this case, I will do a layer flatten image and I will just run the filter manually. So we'll go into image nomic portraiture. And sometimes that happens, especially with higher ISO shots, you still have to do it manually. Go in and just select the skin tones that you want evened out. And you're going to add a little bit more bite to this. Turn up the softness. There we go, that's better. Press OK. Okay. Go to the top layer, layer mask, and do a height all. Now the only thing you have to do is paint the effect here in the areas where you want it. Don't overdo it again. 
because you don't want your image looking like you retouched it too much or as we call it you don't want your model to be looking like a Barbie doll. There we go. Okay, looks pretty nice. Now in this image I won't use the Intensify Pro for the very simple reason I like the soft look here. I'm actually going to enhance that a little bit with Alien Skin Exposure X and finding the right preset for that. Don't overdo it. There we go. This looks pretty nice. A little bit freaky. This is nice, like a midsummer's dream or something. So a before and after. Really love this effect. And press apply. The only thing is on the bottom part, I think I need to cut off just a little bit. Now some people ask me like, okay Frank, do you do this with your aspect ratio locked? You can do it, but nowadays you can print on almost any size. So if I know I'm doing a, a piece that I do for myself, I will not lock my aspect ratio because I can always change that later on. So what I will do is just do it like this, just free. There we go. Nice. Give it a little bit of pop with curves. Love it. Now I want to take this a little bit up because this is a little bit too dark. So I'm going to take my uh, dodge tool and to show you guys what we're doing, we're actually going to do a duplicate layer on which I'm going to do the effect. There we go. I'm just going to add a little bit of light here. Again, this is very, very taste sensitive. So some people like to go a little bit more overboard than I do. I always like to keep it a little bit more natural. You could say that I'm now painting with my light. And again, do zoom in because this was a high ISO shot and we don't want to have a lot of noise in there. So this looks all pretty cool. Fit on screen. Okay, nice. File. Oh, sorry, first layer flatten image and then file close. Okay, so now you saw me using the MacFun plugins today. And let me switch to also where you can see me. Okay, so you saw me using the MacFun plugins today. Now we have a very special offer for you guys from MacFun. So if you go to our website and you actually go to www. Oops, www and then Frank, ah, it's pretty dark here, frankdoorhoff.com slash macfun. You actually see their offer. So this is a really cool offer for you guys. And I'll actually also show it now on the bottom part for you. So you can write it down and it's only today and it can change. It can also be there tomorrow, but I don't know. They changed it for our digital classroom and it's now 99.99 for the complete package, which is normally 488. So you can use all the plugins that I now use from Mac fun, but it only works on Mac. So watch out for that. Okay. So the other thing is that's really cool is our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I really appreciate that. And you show your appreciation for digital classroom and all the other stuff we put out there. Okay. So some final things. Um, you guys always ask me like, when are you going to come to the UK? When are you going to come to the, um, the uh, New York? Well, we have some really cool stuff for you guys. If you go to my website again, frankdoorhoff.com and you do this, New York, NY, you actually come on a landing page for New York and it's a $3.99 workshop full day and you get a Capture One license for $2.99. So you get that for free. And for the UK, we are now working on securing locations and we actually have two amazing locations already. And one will be an A to Z workshop, meaning it's a complete photo shoot uh, and touch up. The only thing is we have an early bird registration for 45 pounds, but this is still January 10th. So don't wait too long because this is only until January 10th. 
And on January 5th, we will do a full workshop for £175. So make sure you are there and you can register on the website. And of course, we have also the ultimate weekend. So if you go to my website, you can visit them all. I don't want to talk too much about this. Okay, so for the final part, let's switch back to our camera. And I will say goodbye to you guys. And I will actually sh tell you some other stuff that's really interesting. There we go. So I have to walk now, or actually I have to run, because everybody's waiting for me. So there we go. Okay, do you have me in the picture, Annemiek? Yes, I do. There we go. So this is our book, Mastering the Model Shoot. It's a really big book. It's a coffee table book. No, I'm just kidding. This is, of course, a mock-up. And the book went bestseller. Uh, I wrote it together with Scott Kelby and their amazing team. So it's one of the best teams in the world for book design. And Okay, to just take it out. Oh, she's holding it. So it's an awesome book. <laughs> and the whole tour in this year will be called Mastering the Model Shoot. Now, we will do several locations in Europe and, of course, abroad. So New York, the UK, and we also do them in the Netherlands. So if you want to know more about it, go to our website, frankdorov.com, and we have daily updates. If you have any questions that you want to see discussed in the next digital classroom, just drop me an email and we will try to do that. For now, I would like to thank you guys so very much for watching. I love to thank BenQ and Rogue Expo Imaging for making this all possible and supplying this stuff to you guys for free. And I will tell you one thing. We'll be back with some more exciting stuff, smaller digital classrooms in between, and of course, the whole new version of Digital Classroom will be in February. And let me see, we have an ultimate weekend on the 26th and 27th of February in the Netherlands. We have New York on February 13th. We have the UK on June 4th and 5th. And the next Digital Classroom will be on February 24th. Thank you so very much for watching, guys. Signing off from the Netherlands, where it's ice raining and it's very, very cold. But we had a fun time in the studio. And thank you so very much for watching. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>